well, it's a hard, here have been several hard acts to follow. Oh, and uh, uh, let, let me just observe that I'm the only man who gets to the platform tonight. So something is changing in London. Um, <laughs> uh, but to, 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 and I think I've lost a f mic here, sorry. Cammy, you've got to leave me alone next time. Don't, don't embrace me so hard. Um, so first, Natalie, thank you for your wonderful words, and thank you and your team for having made tonight possible, and your colleagues at Chatham House for having made the two days possible. It is fantastic. Thank you. Uh, to, to Sherry and Cammy, it goes without saying. And Nan, thank you again. You were his partner and all of our friend because of that. Thank you. Uh, and I'm thrilled that we are doing this here in London. It was very much Kofi's city. He had many cities, but this one was a very special one to him, as was Accra and New York and Geneva and no doubt countless others. But our London, the London of all of us who've come here tonight, you know, is a London which cares deeply about the world. Uh, when we wanted to launch a campaign against debt relief, it was with our allies here in the UK uh, that we did it. And Kofi spoke uh, from a cathedral here, uh, went up to Glen Eagles in Scotland to press G8 leaders to pursue it. So often, London was at the center of our uh, ambitions. And of course, it is a London that not just cares deeply about policy and about the United Nations, but a London also of the creative arts. Not a London, I'm sorry to say, of Sesame Street, but a London which contributes so much else. And people like Richard Curtis in this town and Bono and many others have contributed so much to this popular culture dimension uh, of, of the United Nations. So as we reflect now, some nine months or so after Kofi's death, uh, about the legacy and contribution I cannot think of a better place to be doing it than here in London today and tomorrow. And you know, just the fact that we've had to battle our way through road closures and everything else to get here, uh, in a way, just uh, makes the point even more strongly. Uh, London is big enough for two very different events in one evening, <laughs> representing completely different value sets and ways of looking at the world. And, you know, I was very, very worried when we learned that this would clash with President Trump's visit, not because of that, because I knew our message would hold up, uh, but because of just the sheer inconvenience. Would we find this hall closed tonight that we wouldn't be able uh, to get into it? And Trish, my wife, who shared my UN years with me, said, don't worry, Kofi would have expected it to be like that. Whenever did you in the UN really control the whole narrative, control the whole stage? There were always people doing other things. He would have taken a wry amusement about uh, the very different messages being delivered in different parts of London tonight, but would have had great confidence that it was our message of multilateralism, of engagement, of a better world for all, uh, which would uh, prevail. Uh, let, let me pass greetings from Shashi Tarore, who should have been with us tonight to sort of slightly even the gender uh, equation, but was, is, is caught by the, the, the issue, an issue of Indian politics that the new parliament is being sworn in, and there are so few left now in the opposition, I think he thought he shouldn't men miss that date. Uh, his vote will be needed uh, there. Um, but and the, the other thing I just want to say is that we do intend to take as much interaction from people not on the stage as possible, but just practically it's hard uh, to go to the floor for questions. So people have been tweeting in and sending in by social media questions which we will be asking uh, later in the discussion. Now, let me, just if I may, start with something a little personal, but I think something particularly after Kami that we can perhaps all relate to. My youngest daughter, who's now 17, Kofi was her godfather. And rather cheekily, I asked him 
to give a sermon at the uh, rather austere Anglican Episcopalian church that we as a family attended in Washington uh, on, on the occasion of Phoebe's baptism. And I'm just going to read several paragraphs from what he said. What a wonderful time to be a little girl. Nothing need hold her back from nursery to school and college and adulthood, she will not have to face the old barriers of gender, race, or religion. Opportunity, knowledge, and friendship will be hers for the asking. She will grow up in a century of invention and change. Who can doubt the world she leaves will be very different from the one she has entered? She and her contemporaries will have the chance to forge from their parents' world, a place where there is finally the space for all human beings to meet their full potential in their physical and spiritual lives. But first, Phoebe and all of us must overcome to work today's world of great uncertainty, in which none of us can feel truly safe from violence, from epidemic disease, from climate change, or a host of other dangers that have no respect for national borders. It's also a very unfair world in which many of the dangers are most threatening to the innocent and powerless. He then went on to talk of uh, HIV AIDS. It happened to be the occasion of, of World AIDS Day. And he said that 60% of women and girls were the victims of, of AIDS. He noted that there were many children in the world who had to get by on less per day than no doubt Phoebe and her friends uh, would get in pocket money. But she ca he came back, as one would have anticipated from him at the end, to an optimistic close, one I think which is as valid today as when he said it in 2002. But let's also, all of us, make a collective promise to do whatever we can to make this world safe for little girls everywhere, so that every human being has the same chance to, to achieve her full potential. May God bless you all. And those were Coffee's words that, that night, and I you know, remember them very, very vividly and strongly to today. And this was a Secretary General who, for one of his friends and staff, had taken a precious day out to come and celebrate this occasion with family and friends. But he was a Secretary General who, over his 10 years in office, also found time uh, in what I referred earlier today to as the UN's golden moment or age, to build up an extraordinarily ambitious uh, program of change across pretty much every act that the UN engaged in from peace building and peacemaking to civil society and business relations to development and human rights and humanitarian intervention. And he did this, as you heard already, through this extraordinary use of the pulpit. This was not a diffident, shy, retiring Secretary General who hid behind the protocols of diplomacy. This was a Secretary General who, as many have said, was a secular pope uh, who reached out and became an extraordinarily global figure. He loved to joke, uh, particularly after retirement, of the times he was mistaken for Morgan Freeman. <laughs> but I have a message for Morgan Freeman. I knew Kofi, and you had no Nan Anan, as Kofi did. Um, and it was this extraordinary couple who captured the imagination of the world, who in their own humility and graciousness and love and inclusion of all, friends, the world, anybody listening to them, anybody they were meeting, uh, I think signaled a purpose-driven world of values and commitment, which seems sadly at the moment a long way away from the world of, of today. And, and I, you know, therefore cannot think of better people to share this pulpit with, pulpit, this, this platform, this stage with tonight. Uh, than two, uh, and the first of them is Amina Mohammed, uh, a, someone who has followed me in what I consider one of the world's great and blessed jobs, the UN 
De Deputy Secretary Generalship. It doesn't seem particularly blessed at the time. It just seems like a grim attack on your uh, physical and mental powers 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. But when Amina was appointed, I think uh, there were few of us who doubted what an inspired choice it was. Uh, she had had uh, an extraordinary role in the UN bringing together the SDGs. I had worked similarly on the MDGs before it, but I would always tell her the SDGs are so many times more complicated but now that people have understood the power of these goals. Uh, she was Minister of the Environment, subsequently um, in, in Environment. Um, she has a background at doing development policy work at Columbia uh, University much earlier in her career. But since 2017 has been the Deputy Secretary General, and you can tell the wear and tear of the job by the way she's about to join us on stage, Amina.